further ado, I'd like to hand over to author, military expert, and regular Conservative Home columnist, Dr. Sarah Ingham. Thank you. Thank you, Angus, and good morning, everyone. And welcome to this uh, conference on defence and security at a crucial time for all of us. Um, it was two years ago that uh, the integrated review was announced with its uh, tilt to the Pacific. And it seemed um, a very optimistic time for defence and defence procurement not least with the promise of £242 billion pounds being offered over the next 10 years. So, happy days. Then, almost a year later, February 2022, Russia began its so-called special military operation in Ukraine. An, unlegal, an illegal and illegitimate and unjustified invasion which has left us with the first state-on-state -state conflict in Europe. This has upended everything in defence and in defence establishments across NATO and Europe. For example, Poland has just increased its defence budget to 4% of GDP. A Pacific tilt was the central plank of the integrated review but are we now going to tilt back towards the North Atlantic and Europe? Europe, uh, the United Kingdom has led the way in giving lethal aid to Ukraine, and we will be sending Challenger 2 tanks. However, one area of particular concern to the NATO Secretary General is the shortage of ammunition across the line. In Europe, it is looking like the defence cupboard is bare and needs restocking urgently. I will suggest that just as the pandemic and its aftermath highlighted and exacerbated the existing problems within the, of the National Health Service, in the context of helping Ukraine, might the same be true of defence procurement in the United Kingdom? Are we on a war footing? On a happier note, the defence procurement and the defence industry is an industrial powerhouse for our country. We can be really, really proud of it. Uh, Britain is the second largest defence exporter in the world. Last year, it brought in not far off £9 billion in export earnings. Um, there are more than 130,000 direct employees in de the defence industry, which turned over almost £24 billion last year, and it employs 6,000 apprentices. And if you look at a map of the defence industrial establishments across the UK, it really does seem to deliver the promise of levelling up. So, there is an awful lot of moving parts to defence procurement, there's an awful lot of criticism for it, not least that there has been 13 reviews of defence procurement in the last 35 years. If one reads um, the National Audit Reports or the Public Accounts Committee um, it, into defence procurement, one can sense a certain irritation that these problems are recurring and recurring and recurring. That does not get in the way of the fact that it's a fantastic industry and we've got world-class expertise in it. To untangle all the um, issues facing defence procurement, and we only have an hour, I would like to thank um, our distinguished panel for being here today and might I introduce them in alphabetical order. So, on my left... Um, it's not something Conservatives often say. On my left Definitely. is uh, the Minister for De Defence Procurement, Alex Chalk, who comes to defence from the law. And um, he is uh, MP for Cheltenham, mm -hmm. is that right? Mm -hmm. Excellent. Now, far end of the table over there is um, Tobias Elwood, Bournemouth East MP, is that right? right. And Chairman of the Defence Select Committee. 
um, taking um, perhaps a more Olympian and detached view of um, the issues in front of us is um, Professor John Louth, who is ex-RAF and ex-Royal United Services Institute. Is that fair? Fair enough. Good. And finally, last but very much not least, is um, James Sutherland, MP for Bracknell, who served with the British Army for, was it 20... 27 years as a regular. 27 years as a regular. And um, now uh, chairman of the Armed Forces Act Committee. Was I, I was chair of the Armed Forces Select Committee um, for the bill. So uh, right. it was a great privilege. Excellent. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your panel. Thank you very much. If I might, um, could we please examine, could we have a little snapshot from each of you as to where you think defence procurement might be right now and where it might be in the medium to long term. Big ask, I know, but um, perhaps I can start off with the, with the Minister. Well, uh, thank you very much indeed. And thank you for that introduction. I was quite pleased that you identified who, who I was because it wasn't that long ago and knocked on a door and the door opened and they said, oh, I know who you are. You might be better than your brother, but we don't want David Miliband here. I, so I'm not, I'm not David Miliband. So happy to confirm that. So I've got two minutes, and um, the next two minutes I'll do world peace. Uh, but let's see, let's see what we can do in, in this period of time. So look, you have more than two. More than two minutes. Oh wow. Um, okay. So look, I, I, as Sarah indicated, I approached this um, as uh, as a lawyer. I was Solicitor General before, and, and previously a criminal barrister, doing everything from fraud to uh, terrorism and that sort of thing. Now, I, I only mention that because um, I've approached this issue of defence procurement in an entirely uh, unsentimental way. I'm interested in what promotes national security, what can we afford, what's sustainable, what works. And that's really all I, I care about. So I just want to talk about just a few things. So um, the first point is you, you touched on what we've done in Ukraine. Let's just take a second to just put a bit of flesh on that boat, on those boats. That means 200,000 rounds of artillery ammunition. It means over 250 armoured fighting vehicles. It means three million uh, small arms rounds. It means UAVs, plastic explosives, night vision goggles, uh, winter equipment, uh, even seeking helicopters. And we do all this because we believe in the international rules-based order. But what are the key messages that we've learned? Well, here are just some. First, we can no longer be in a world, you talked about war footing, of stop-start procurement. In other words, you go for Gucci weapons, then you stop. Gucci weapons, then you stop. We have to move to always on. That's lesson number one. Lesson number two is we must be proportionate in our procurement. What does that mean? What that means is you don't procure small arms ammunition with the same uh, levels of assurances as you procure a battleship. You've got to ensure that it's pro uh, proportionate. And the reason for that is time is a vulnerability. There are two basic baskets of risk, it seems to me, as a lawyer coming into this. One, when you procure something, will it have the capability you need? That's basket of risk number one. But the basket of risk number two is will it come on time? And delay is a factor. And you may take the view that 80% capability today is better than 100% capability tomorrow. Why? Because tomorrow never comes. We have to get much more alive to the risk that comes from delay. That's the second point I wanted to make. And then I want to talk a bit about other factors that we need to bear in mind, and just this very much is these opening, um, opening remarks. You talked about uh, us as exporters. That's true, but make no mistake, other countries are working very effectively, arguably more effectively than us. Look at France. I've recently been uh, in India. I can tell you, folks, whether we like it or not, they are stealing a march on us in, France, in places like that. And they are doing so because they configure their procurement industry for their export potential. So they will ask early on in the process, what should we procure with a view to what can we export? Because they recognize that keeping their industrial base warm is essential for their overall capability. So let me just end with this. Exports are important. Proportionate procurement is important. And final point, don't always procure a product, procure a pipeline. What do I mean by that is if you're looking at UAVs and drones, don't just simply say, well, we're going to procure that drone. Recognize these things iterate very, very fast, and sometimes you'll need to procure that pipeline over a five-year period, recognizing that the very product you are seeking to obtain will iterate and develop over that time. So those, I hope, are just some um, uh, uh, initial thoughts, 
As I say, Alex Chalk, not David Miliband, happy to be here. <laughs> <laughs> Tobias, can you follow up, please? Yes, thank you very much indeed. Firstly, can I say, say thank you to Conservative Home for putting this together, because sometimes uh, military types seem to talk in echo chambers, and it's so important that we're able to elaborate why we need a defence ar architecture, why we need to expand our capability, because there is a symbiotic relationship between our economy and our security. If you don't invest in security, your economy then starts uh, to be uh, challenged because of supply chains, access to uh, sea routes and so forth. Even in Ukraine, for example, it's been said that had the war not taken place, inflation would be at 4%. Imagine 4%. It would be a lot easier to uh, deal with those industrial actions uh, if uh, that was the, the, the value rather than the 11%. So explaining this to a wider audience, so you recognize why we need to invest more in defense, I'm glad that's why, why we actually are here today. So thank you to Conservative uh, Home for that. This is an opportunity that we find ourselves for Britain. As has been said, we are on the foothills, potentially, of a new uh, Cold War with both Russia and China becoming more and more in alignment. But we're seeing greater political appetite from the United Kingdom. A new opportunity as well, because of the, the Windsor framework for us to work with our allies. But our convening power, I think, was illustrated when we slid those Challenger tanks across the table. Now, Ukraine doesn't really need Challenger tanks. They need a single platform, probably Leopard. But the fact that we did that opened up the doors for others to do the same, and that was absolutely uh, critical. The very character of conflict is changing, which makes Alex Chalk's job all the harder as to perhaps you know, project, uh, to uh, commit to something that uh, uh, you know, pipelines take five to ten years to procure kit. What do we need for the future itself? I, I have a real concern. I'm really pleased to see Alex is here. I think he's going to be one of the best procurement ministers we have. My concern is how long he's going to stay in the job. Uh, and uh, there's the thoroughfare, a churn, if you like. Uh, Marc Francois in the audience, the Defence Select Committee went oh. to, uh, to Wharton in Lancashire. We saw the Tempest. This is a formidable aircraft. It's the size of Blackbird, if those of you remember that from the Cold War. It is huge, and it's going to be the best long-distance uh, long bomber aircraft, the most stealthiest in the world. You can't land it on an aircraft carrier. We established for that exact reason. But we met the chief director who's taken this pro program through. He had a timeline on the wall as to where things are going each year up to 2030 when we'll see this thing flying. And I asked him, is he going to be there when this happens? He goes, absolutely. I'm going to stay here. I'm going to lead this. I then cheekily asked, how many procurement ministers do you think you'll have between now and then? And he was too polite to say. But I think that is the problem is to actually have control over what's being designed. So, Alex, I hope you stay yeah, there, not point. just now, for now, the reshuffle, the no doubt, will be during the summer, but also when, of course, we win the general election and you uh, are there afterwards, rather than being moved to prisons minister, as seems to be the case with previous <laughs> uh, procurement ministers who show their value. But the purpose of any review, I think it's worth just confirming, if I may, is firstly to assess what the threats are that are coming over Hill, what the threats are that we deal with today. Then confirm your own ambitions, your own place in the world. Do we want to do more than other countries? I believe we do. It's in our DNA to do so. And then the final thing, when you look at those two things, that helps you then determine how your defense posture, your actual architecture, your security architecture should change. That means you don't have a price cap placed on you that says this is the amount of money you're going to get. By the way, you've got cyber and security coming over the hill. You've got to invest more in that. Unfortunately, as what happened with the last in integrated review, it meant that there was a hit on the Army, Air Force, and Navy budgets, so they <coughs> had to then actually uh, endure serious cuts uh, in what was going on. This is, I should say, what Alex inherited rather than being responsible for. So I asked the question today, is the world getting more dangerous or less? And if you think the answer is more, that we are on the foothills of a new Cold War, that we do need to upgrade our defense posture, then getting procurement right is so, so important. And as we debate this and get into more detail, you're going to hear all sorts of calls for weapon systems and things like that. My call, my request to the MOD is to treat it like a chessboard, which I've said in the past. We can buy all the expensive pieces at the back, like the Type 26, like the Type 45, like the Challenger 3. 
but you also need to have the pawns that dominate the board. You need the constabulary capability that's able to patrol the South China Seas, patrol our own, uh, uh, own skies as well. The A-10 Thunderbolt, for example, can be just as capable in a benign uh, environment such as Afghanistan or even Ukraine as well. We tend to go for the high octane, the fastest, the most furious, and the most expensive. And like the F-35, when we wanted 138, the money wasn't there, and we had to cut back to, I think, we're down to 48, possibly 72 in the future. So it's versatility, modularity, and readiness. These are the things that we now need to be uh, aware of, and more and more collaboration with our neighbors, because we can't afford to make all these things ourselves, and there is a sense of urgency now because of what's coming over the hill. Thank you. Professor John. I think a political narrative and political discourse is important in setting the direction of travel, particularly when there's a set of uh, identifiable threats and future emerging threats. So that's hugely important. But, but facts are also important. And they're, they're, they're many they're degraded these days. You know, nobody quite likes facts, but facts are kind of cool. Mm. Uh, I think since 1998, transformation of UK defence procurement now runs at about 4.8 billion, uh, kind of evenly split between the two main parties. That's an awful lot of money to spend on transformation, it seems to me. And in terms of acquisition, there are two key issues that drive the uh, narrative challenges that acquisition seems to face. The, the first of these is procedural, and I'll come on to that briefly in a moment. And the second is technology. To, to come here today, I just picked over a couple of my books. In, in 2010, I wrote that uh, the timeline for transformation was about 12 to 15 years in terms of technologies. And I kind of thought, when I, when I saw my uh, new daughter in the womb in 1996, kind of hazy little picture, looked like some kind of alien in the mothership, you know, a bit, bit freaky what was to come. And then when I saw my friend's daughter, same position, 2010, absolutely clear transformation of about 13 to 15 years in terms of those imaging technologies. Uh, then another book, 2019, uh, the British defense condition. Uh, that the literature was then saying that tech transformation was running at about three years. I republished it two years later, 2021, that technological transformation was running at one year. I've got a book out next month on uh, defense exports and it's running at about three to 12 months in terms of the speed of technological transformation. It's revolutionary, revolutionary, and we've never been here in our history before, and that must drive the considerations we have for acquisition and defense procurement. And I'll come on, hopefully, during the, the, the session, what that means for things like, like Tempest, etc. Uh, the second one is procedural. I've, I've just written a report with with colleagues from Redstone Risk, who spent about six years or so allowing me to, to peel back their data, what they've been doing with, with the, their clients and the community more broadly. And it just seems to me that it confirms one of my academic prejudices, that UK defence procurement freezes its requirements far, far too quickly. If you go back to how we used to do these things, it was much more fluid now, since 98, 99, there's an urgent need to identify the user requirement, the systems requirement. Doesn't mean not much in terms of a political setting, but for business, that's huge. We then decide that the milestones to deliver that user and systems requirements are fixed. The profits flow to the businesses through those milestones, so everybody's incentivized to manage the milestone rather than manage the effect, which the bias talks about and which the minister talks about. You cannot possibly program manage the capability or the effect if everybody's linked to meeting payment milestones. Now, there is some transformation going on in terms of how Tempest, uh, Global Combat Air Program, is going to be potentially managed, where the focus is on understanding those technology risks under on, uh, early on, rather. But if we procure in the same way we've been procuring since 98, we'll always get the same kind of stuff. And that means, to my mind at least, that we'll always have this narrative of some things are failing, some things are difficult, and it's suboptimal. 
And as Tobias very wisely points out, we cannot be suboptimal now. This is the time where we have to be at our very best. And boring though it is, we've got to go into the procedures, we've got to go into the management practices, and we've got to actually understand through the practitioners what the challenges are, perhaps. Thank you. James, you were at the sharp end. I was. For 26 years. Indeed. Or, Indeed. So you know all about procurement, equipment, or perhaps you could share your thoughts with us. Yeah, thank you. I was, um, I was at Sandhurst in October 2019 when I got a call from Bracknell Conservatives. Um, I'm forever grateful because that saved me from two years at Army headquarters <laughs> afterwards. Um, so I'm forever indebted to the Conservative Party. Um, but I think I'm the senior member of the House of Commons in terms of rank and also the most current. Um, so it's an interesting conundrum now where I'm a politician, clearly supportive of the government, but also having used all of this kit in recent memory, um, I also know to a certain extent what the military needs, and particularly the army. So I'm just going to make a couple of opening points, um, opening contentions, if you like. The first thing is that uh, I think it'd be wrong to say that our procurement process is broken. Far from it, it's not. If the MOD can't get this right with the experts they've got in the MOD, then who else can do it? And ultimately, I have huge, huge confidence and faith in senior officers, senior civil servants at the MOD, to give the minister the right advice. So the decisions, when they are taken, are usually the right ones. And I think that's the message that I really want to put across this morning. Um, but also, defence is very complex. It's very specialist. Um, and I think that ultimately, everything we do in defence depends upon what the MOD asks defence to do. And I'm really clear on that, and I'll explain why. Firstly, I think we need to look at defence tasks. They were called defence planning assumptions, and now called defence tasks. What are we asking our forces to do? Because that then drives all those behaviours, all that procurement activity that we need to make sure we get it right. I think right now, we've got a slight issue with the army. Why? Because defence tasks are telling us that we have to be able to deploy a division at large scale, armoured division. Can we do that? Question mark. I don't know. But ultimately, therefore, we need to work out whether we're asking defence to do the right thing. My personal view, because NATO has told us that we need to be doing it, is that we do need to put a large scale deployment division armoured into the field at readiness. We're doing that. We know we can do that. But can we sustain it? And that's obviously an interest for me as an ex ROC officer. I think also um, it's about consistency of purpose. And I was at Army headquarters in 2012-2014 when we were asked through Army 2020 to go to a medium-scale enduring rule of five. Three years later, having commanded my regiment, I went back into the land TLB and was told to put it back to large scale. So we've not had that consistency of message and purpose over the last decade. So we haven't helped ourselves in terms of political direction. So the important thing now is let's work out what we want our Army to do and our Navy and our RAF and then stick to it. Really, really important. And therefore, that will affect behaviours to the positive. Just two last points. Firstly, the procurement process is too complex. We allow too many changes to requirements. Let's work out what we want and stick to it. Why? Because by continuing changing the requirement, what that does, you put more and more add-ons onto the platform. Look at Ajax. What happens is the requirement bears no correlation at all to what you want it to be years down the line. And therefore, it's about the debate between exquisite exclusivity versus sufficient availability. Yeah, yeah. And what I want to see, basically, are defence, our forces in defence, well supported with the best equipment, but not overburdened with complexity. We need more, perhaps, of the right kit, not less of exquisite kit. And I think the last thing is this. I think this is really important for now. Our JOKER, our Joint Operational Estimate Capability Readiness, right now is flashing red for the Army. We have work to do with the Army, no question about it. And that's going to involve money. And that's going to involve the MOD asking the Treasury for more money to fix the Army. And my last, last point is this. Right now in Ukraine, it's pretty serious stuff. But of course, what's happening in Ukraine right now for us is a war, not the war. Therefore, we have to be really, really careful that we're not throwing the baby out with the bathwater in terms of what we're gifting to the Ukrainians. We absolutely have to stop the Russians. And the language in NATO right now is fascinating. It's gone in the last 12 months from defend Ukraine to defeat. That's fascinating. But by the same token, we have to make sure that we are able, our armed forces are able to do what else might come down the line. 
and that requires fixing. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, much food for thought there. So, if I might exercise the Chairman's um, prerogative and ask some questions of my own, please. Um, at the moment, do the ways and the means match the ends, in, as um, soldiers seem to talk a lot about in those terms? In that, are we pursuing um, the capabilities that we absolutely need, or are these um, uh, a little luxurious at a time of land war in Europe? Um, that this isn't to detract from the fantastic uh, achievement of having two aircraft <coughs> carriers, but, um, you know, have we got enough armoured vehicles? Uh, can we afford to get this wrong? Um, would anyone like to...? Um, yes. Um, well, uh, I think there are a couple of things I would say. So, no, at the moment, we don't have enough armoured uh, fighting vehicles. I can see Marc Francois has got a question. I suspect it may even be on that point. He can wait. Um, he can wait. Uh, <laughs> the, the great Marc Francois, who uh, keeps us on our toes brilliantly. So, look, just to, we, we do need more armoured fighting vehicles. It's worth reflecting that, actually, uh, we procured something like 2,500 armoured fighting vehicles for the war in Afghanistan. And we're now, of course, having to pivot towards... A, a completely different capability. We have also given two, over 200 to, I, into Afghanistan. We certainly need to, but you ask a really important question, which I think effectively what you're saying is, look, do you really need two aircraft carriers? Can't you just sort of pivot, slap one of those off and then put that more I, I, into the army? Of course, the, the thing that I've discovered doing this job is it is so lengthy and so complex. A decision that you would make tomorrow is not going to bear fruit for many, many years to come, which takes me onto, onto, onto two points, really. First... We've got to get a better handle of this issue of time. Delay is a massive vulnerability. Because whether you're procuring um, Ellie Taxis, which is a, a highly sophisticated battlefield communication system, or whether, by the way, you're procuring uh, Ajax, if you extend it over a long period of time, that creates risk for tinkering, which is the point that um, uh, some, some have referred to, and I could deal with this issue of, of churn as well. More space for more people to stick their oar in, point one. Point two is there is a fundamental risk of obsolescence. So one of the things we have to do, whether, however many aircraft carriers, this country has got to become more productive in the way that it does procurement. Right? That is absolutely mission critical. Uh, and frankly, uh, other countries are more productive than us in the way that they do it. And just a final, final point. If you look, and I've now spoken to my German counterparts, my French counterparts, and it's quite interesting. When I go to the meeting of the MEC, which is UK, Germany, and we talk about, you know, this is the 10th meeting, my opposite number, do you know what he says? Ah, oh, yes, I remember the first one. So he'd been in place for the whole of 10 years of these, uh, of these meetings, and that goes to the point that uh, um, Tobias was talking about. Let's ensure that we have the right people in period for a longer period of time, but you also do it over a shorter period overall to help drive some of the uh, productivity in the system. It's absolutely essential. Um, I, I read somewhere that uh, one project took 19 years from concept to contract. It's, it's, with it's ridiculous. So, you know, here's this mobile phone. I mean, it's updated all the time. Uh, James, you wanted to come in. Yeah, very briefly. I think the easiest thing in the world for yeah, the minister to do is to work out what's available on the open market and buy it. Commercial off-the-shelf cots, I think, is the wrong thing to do. Ultimately, if we need to buy it, then we have to reserve the right to buy it because our troops and our aviators and sailors need the best kit. But actually, commercial off-the-shelf does nothing at all for our nascent defence manufacturing industry. So in this post-Brexit world, I'm absolutely clear that the UK has a responsibility to build it and to sell it, um, which is why I want to see the right equipment being procured, the right equipment for us, the so Type 31s. We're talking modular, simplistic, cost-effective platforms that we know we can sell. Look at the frigates at the moment. People want the frigate because it's the right platform. So personally, I want to basically focus much more on our defence manufacturing industry, noting, of course, that comes with complexity, it comes with time, and the cabin cycle is very, com very, very, very complex. So uh, COTS if we need it, but ultimately, this has to be about British industry and <coughs> exports. Tobias, would you...? Yeah, thank you. But if the frigate, the tw Type 26 is brilliant, just to take on that point. But if you only have 18 frigates and destroyers, you've got about six working at any one time. If you think that some in, uh, are being uh, up upgraded and then others are there for training, six in this world for the UK is simply not enough. 
So they are the expensive pieces on the chessboard I spoke of. You need the pawns, you need the corvettes, you need other things that are going to be able to patrol, do the constabulary duties, and call in the bigger guys when something happens. And that applies on the land and indeed in the air domains as well. We are entering a new Cold War. You go back to 1991, and we had 48 frigates and destroyers. We had 36 fast jet squadrons. Today we only have eight, and uh, as the size of the armed forces as well, awful lot of talk about numbers, but we are really getting down to rock bottom, but expecting them to do more and more and more. And this is having an impact on the welfare, can I just say, a bit of retention and recruitment uh, as well. I could summarize this debate very simply by saying, if you don't have the money to be able to do procurement wisely, then I'm afraid we're not going to have the defense capability for the future. That's what we're suffering from at the moment. We need to make the case, which is why conferences like this are so important, to tell the, the electorate why we need to increase our defense budget. Unless we do that, there will be no call, no clamor in the Treasury to say, actually, the electorate out there are calling for more money. Why? Because they want more money for schools, for hospitals as well. They're only going to get it if our world remains safe. If our, if our world starts to erode, the point was made very briefly, this isn't just about Ukraine. This is Russia, new ideology, lining up with China to challenge the West the way we are. Very few countries step forward to step up to the plate. We're one of them. If we're going to do it, we need the hard power. We need the budget. We need to give the procurement capability there to make sure we have got the kit for the future. But we also need greater capability to share. The brimstone missile would be something that, that you know, people here will be familiar with. This is an amazing bit of kit. Fired from our typhoon, 20 kilometer range. But it, nothing else in the British Army, Air Force or Navy can use it. We should be able to use that on the Apache, on the Warrior, on the you know, Challenger tank, their main battle tank, on the Ajax, on the Boxer. It should be able to clip on anywhere to be used, even on a ship. None of our ships, not a single ship, can fire anything on land other than using the big gun at the front. This is the sort of thinking that we need to change because of the changing character of conflict. Oddly enough, the uh, Ukrainians asked for the brimstone. They found a way to fire it out of the back of a four-ton truck. If they can do it, so can we. Okay. Um, I'll observe that China's just announced that an increase in defense spending of 7% per year. So um, it's time we really focused. As has many NATO countries, including yeah, yeah. Poland, France, and Germany as well. So again, we need to be make the case to the British public, I think. That's where we need to go. But can we, if money is being wasted, can that case, uh, John, can that case be made as, as effectively as it could be? Well, we, we need to be honest. It's extremely challenging to go to the public and, and make a case for defence inside out if it's been accompanied by a whole range of reports to say this is suboptimal, that this process has failed. I mean, that, that, that is just something that we're asking an awful lot from the British public to, to swallow, it seems to me. And I, I come back to boring old facts. You know, I, don't, I know we don't like facts. But if, but if you look at data, you know, the programmes that we're thinking of creating, the programmes that we've created in the past, they have an operational life of 40, 50 years, maybe longer. You know, to think that we can freeze those requirements in the first year of a 50-year programme is barking mad. It goes right back to the procedural points I, I, I make earlier. And the one thing that I have, I have to admire and what he for doing, actually, is learning from experience. So when, when we think of Tempest or GCAP, they're not thinking about a 50-year programme, we've frozen the requirement now, go fill your boots industry. They're, they're talking about, well, actually, for the first uh, iterative, iterative years of understanding what we want, we'll spend money in partnership with industry. Industry and match funding an awful lot of the TRLs 1 to 3 that we're, we're seeing generated for programs like Tempest. Uh, to freeze that maturing technology, understand how it can be integrated, to anchor it on things that we know well in terms of mature technologies is the way to go. And that's kind of what our experience of risk management and effects-based management has been telling us over the years. It's not a political narrative. You're not going to make a wonderful speech on, I want to change the procedure from A to B. You know, everyone would be asleep. But that's kind of where we need to be, it seems to me. And Tobias you know, looked at Tempest up, up in uh, the northwest a short while ago. I can absolutely guarantee, I would bet 
well, not my house, but I bet my daughter's house on it, that uh, <laughs> the tempest to buy a saw will not be the tempest that is generated in a few years' time. It may not even be that kind of thing. It may be lots of smaller things. Perhaps. Can I throw this debate, please, open to the audience, if I may? Um, Julian Brazier, isn't it, who are uh, sitting in the third row there? Next to Marc Francois, maybe you could offer one after the other. I'm embarrassed to be ahead of somebody as distinguished as, as Mark. Well, yeah. Um, my, my question really is for Alex, a really, really punchy speech, if I may say so. How concerned are you about the infiltration by the Chinese of our, many of our best technology universities? I mean, I've heard it said the only barrier to their ambitions in Cambridge is now the Cambridge District Council's planning department. <laughs> Uh, what a brilliant question. Uh, yes, I, mean, I think, frankly, we are concerned. Um, I, I actually think, well, one of the things that we are doing um, in, in defence, and by the way, this is not just within the MOD, but every single supplier, is they are applying a forensic look at the supply chain, all the bells and whistles that go into these highly complex weapons to try to understand provenance, and in particular, uh, the risk of Chinese or indeed Russian uh, infiltration. So that is happening, first of all, in our supply chains to assure them, but second, also in terms of our uh, infrastructure to satisfy ourselves that there isn't uh, unsatisfactory Chinese involvement with surveillance and so on. So that, that is absolutely taking place, I'm pleased to say. And when I sit down with BAE or Rolls-Royce or Babcock, um, this is something that we're taking extremely seriously. And to pick up the point that James made, as part of building our industrial base, we have to ensure that there is something where, if supposing you're going for your 80% capability rather than your 100% exquisite weapon and so yeah. on, critical to that is to ensure that we ourselves can build a lot of this stuff in a way that assures our pipeline. That does mean sometimes, by the way, that you'll have to do what some have referred to as friend shoring. In other words, build these things with friendly allies, but you do have to make sure that a capability which relies on an exquisite weapon, which is a whole load of Chinese influence in the supply chain, that's not the path for the future. You wanted to jump in, John. Just, just a quick uh, two seconds worth. If we include coding lines, a typical systems architecture in defense is about three and a half, four billion lines. Mm -hmm. To assure that is almost impossible. You can, you can assure chunks of system, you can assure how systems talk to systems, but you cannot possibly assure each of those coding lines because you would kind of have to spend a defence budget on doing it. Not very reassuring. Uh, Mr Francois. Uh, thank you. Mark Francois, member of the Defence Committee. A question for Mr Miliband, please. Hmm. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, Minister, we, we hope you stay in post. Besides, you've been the prisons minister already. So, exactly. So, um, we hope you stay there, not least as the committee has a subcommittee now looking at procurement and you very kindly offered to give evidence yeah. and we might be able to tempt John to do the, the same. And incidentally, uh, anyone who wants to give evidence can submit it via the committee's portal up to the end of the month. So we want as much evidence and suggestions as possible. My question, sir, yeah. very interestingly, Alex, you talked about speeding the process up, yeah. about sometimes having something Excellent. in time, which is 80% of what you want, yeah. rather than waiting a year. I think instinctively many of us would agree with you. Can you say a bit more about your thinking on that? And with the war in Ukraine, is the department prepared to make greater use of what used to be called urgent operational requirements? Yeah. I think you now call them urgent capability yeah. requirements. But in other words, you drop all of the bureaucracy and you do what you have to do as quickly as possible. Can you say a bit more about your thinking yeah. on that, please? Okay. Well, uh, thank you very much. And can I say that, I mean, I came to this conclusion about the 80%, 100%. Imagine my uh, you know, pleasure when I looked at a report that you had contributed to obsolescent and outgunned which made precisely this point so I think there have been a lot of thinkers in this space who uh, have come to that conclusion so let me give you one example of what I'm getting at at the moment we not uncommonly and let's not wear a hair shirt on all this lots of countries face these challenges but we in this country, in terms of how we procure drones, are doing it in a very fragmented way. So special forces go off and get these whizzy things, and then the army do their bit, and the navy do their bit, and then the RAF have their anti-drone software, etc. It's all quite fragmented. Now, when we come to create a strategy to procure drones so we get the savings and the expertise and the industrial strategy, there is an argument that says you don't just go to, say, BAE systems and say, 
build me a drone. What you say is, I want to task you for the next five years, because we've selected you as the best drone supplier, to build iterations of drones. And I know I will take the risk as the procurer that there will be some, frankly, ones that aren't absolutely brilliant in, in the course of that. But over time, I will have enough stock which I will put on my shelves to ensure that if we are in a hot war, there is material that we can deploy. But the point is, I will be insisting upon, give me, start producing them, keep iterating, get on with it. Don't say to me, I'll come back in three years' time with something which is so well-beating and fantastic you're going to be win every single battle. No, I want stuff now. I want you to iterate it and develop it. Look at what the Ukrainians are doing. There's this word that people of a certain age will know, but others will look blankly. MacGyvering, you know, the idea that... Is that ready? Yeah? Some of you are getting it. Right, so um, <laughs> the idea that you take what you've got and you develop fast. And when I speak to special forces, what they say to me is when they hear world-beating, they reach for their revolver because that means something that is way off in the future. They want something now. They can, they can up-spec it and they can and get on with it. So that's, that's one example of what I'm after. And on the second point you make about urgent operational requirements, yes, that is something that's been given active consideration. Um, I would just observe that it seems extraordinary to me that um, the Iranian drones that are causing such Shahid. havoc in um, Ukraine I have been likened to Trabants and because they're so cheap. And um, the West seems to want such extraordinary um, luxe items in comparison. Absolutely right. That is absolutely what, we are, what we're getting after. So I want to have quantity and affordability. And that, by the way, is something, just very quickly, that we want to do across the piece. So you want warships, which aren't just exquisite warships you can't afford, but you keep the pipeline going of, of what is affordable. Great. Um, back to the audience. Um, the lady in the second row here, please. Uh, could you wait for the microphone? Sorry. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Hilary Scott from Canterbury. And I'd just like to um, uh, ask the question about, given the conflict in Ukraine, um, what are your views on how this is now shaping your views about um, what kind of um, encounter that we might have as a country and how you would change your procurement from what it has been to what it might be? Could, could I follow up with another question, please, as well? Um, the gentleman in the second row at the end there. Oh, oh, oh. you do, you do, because we, you're, on, you're online as well. OK, sir. Good morning. Mm -hmm. I've come down from Yorkshire to ask a straight question. Mm. Why do we allow the French to have such a dominant role in our defence procurement? Our old boys network employs all these senior military officers and civil servants to get the job of working with the French defence industry to take the jobs of our workers. Can we make a start by buying Westland instead of a nice cheap deal off Airbus for the next helicopters, please, and get the jobs in Britain and plan ahead and get the budgets planned ahead? Thank you. It, it, it has been, um, I have noticed that the French seem to be, would be horrified at the thought of anyone else building their warships. Uh, gentlemen, can, any, um, any replies, please, to both those questions? Shall I kick off yes. with the first question? I think it's impossible to determine what might happen next in Ukraine. We just don't know. And, of course, military planners, whether it's in NATO, in Russia, in Ukraine, we don't know what's going to happen next. I think it's reasonable to assume that at the end of the winter, so April or May, we'll move from a, an attritional sort of focus to perhaps more manoeuvrist. What that means, I don't know. But what I, what I, what I absolutely do need to um, instill upon the audience is the fact that if the Russians were to mount a spring offensive at that time of the year, then, then the Ukrainians have to be ready. And that's why it's so important now that the equipment is being gifted to the Ukrainians, that they're training on it, that they're ready, and that they can defend whatever comes next. Now, it may well be that the Ukrainians make the decision to adopt a new approach themselves. I'm not a tactician, I'm not in the MOD, I'm backbencher. But I think ultimately what we have to make sure now is that, uh, is that 2023 is somehow decisive, because for it is to continue in the benefits no one. Uh, John, John. I, I, I think it was fun, was it, to be alive in the days in Paris when, uh, when the AUKUS announcement was made. That was fantastic because suddenly the French weren't selling any submarines to the Australians and we'll know in a week or two just what's going to happen for this new combined uh, UK, UK first, uh, US, Australian imperative, which should be a lot of fun. 
and I'll be writing a book about that in two years, which you put on your Christmas list now. Uh, I, I think we, we need to kind of think through as well, though, that companies that may be ultimately headquartered in France or in Europe more broadly have a role in the UK. They, they do employ an awful lot of folk in the UK. They pay taxes here. They contribute here. So I think it is a much broader picture than that. And I think going back to themes that that colleague spoke about earlier, you know, if we, if we want a sort of proper integrated industrial support strategy for frontline defence, these companies in the short to medium term have a huge role to play, and the evidence is that they're investing fairly heavily in the UK as well, so I think it's a much more nuanced picture. Very small point. Can yeah. I just make one very small point about UK and France, right? I was in India recently, uh, uh, India which is massively expanding its armed forces. Give you an idea, they want to place an order uh, for a, a Thales UK weapon, uh, Star Street, which they call LBRM, Laser B Running Missile. They want to place an order for 4,000 missiles, right? Now, that is an extraordinary indication of intent, but where would a lot of that be manufactured? Uh, here in the UK as well as in France. And it's only through that UK-French cooperation that we could potentially land something which not only is great for UK PLC for jobs and livelihoods and apprenticeships and goodness knows what, but also increase the overall industrial capacity so that we are better able to fulfill our orders. So that UK-French relationship is important. Tobias, isn't it true that the future of defence is going to be more and more about international collaboration? Um, I mean, when looking at Queen Elizabeth's inaugural voyage, as it were, part of her support, part of the carrier t support group, what, um, there was a Dutch frigate in there. And um, it seems as if we're collaborating with the Italian and the Japanese on, on the new fighter jet. Isn't this the future for UK def defence procurement and industry? Yes, on these huge procurement projects such as, as FCAS, such as Tempest, we do require other nations to come in. And there's potential uh, that, uh, as, as John was perhaps hinting at, that there may be a merger between the French-German project or some, some form of collaboration. They want to land theirs on the aircraft carrier. The interesting piece about Tempest is actually not the manned aircraft itself, but all the other unmanned uh, vehicles that then go, uh, aerial vehicles that then go with it. You're going to go in there with a swarm of other aircraft, some that you might be willing to lose, ends up as drones like the Iranians and so on. That then becomes interesting. That might be a shared opportunity. The aircraft carrier is interesting because it proved right now that we can't do self-sustaining sovereign capability. We need to lean on our allies. It could be that our allies may not actually agree with the battle that we're going into. Imagine the Falklands crisis, for example. Will people then participate in that? If I may just expand a bit, because this has to be the food for thought for this integrated review, refresh as it's called. Mm. The reason why we're having a refresh is because the world has suddenly moved forward very, very fast indeed. We've had 30 years of relative complacency since the last Cold War. We've entered this new era of insecurity where uh, the status quo isn't strong enough to hold uh, our international rules-based order, can't hold errant nations to account. And we're having to ask ourselves, what on earth do we do when we see these giants of Russia and China increasingly collaborate together to challenge and exploit the limitations of it? By illustration, very quickly, only 34 countries actually signed up to the sanctions against Ukraine. That summarizes where we are. The majority of the world are sitting on their hands, or like India, just wanting to not even participate in it. And that shows you the dangerous world we're now entering. Yeah. Uh, gentleman with his hand up there, please. And if we can have some more. Um, th thank you, sir. Um, thank you very much. My name's Andrew Kinnebra. I run Make UK Defense. Uh, mm. We're particularly focused on the UK supply chain. Um, so my friend from Yorkshire, uh, interesting view on that. Uh, there, we, we're a very successful exporter. I think we need to be very careful that we don't start kidding ourselves. I think the, the, the current measure that we're the second largest defence exporter is now on a 10-year rolling average. That's not really an annual refresh. We're still right at the top. That's a desperately clinging on to the stats to try and keep ourselves in in that top two position. So I think there's a, there's a word of warning there. Um, I wanted to dive specifically into an issue that a lot of our members are, are coming across now, and it's in particular with regard to the SMEs and the mid-tiers. 
Defence is beginning, and I, it seems to be a peculiarly British issue, uh, defence seems to be being considered almost as a sin stock now. Uh, I'm sorry, almost considered in the same way as perhaps the tobacco industry. Oh, yes. Um, we've got numerous examples of companies not being able to lease cars, not being able to get insurance. We've had a company last week with, that has been told their bank account will be withdrawn by a challenger bank. The big high street banks are now saying you've got more than 10% business in defence. They're withdrawing services, overdrafts, loans. It's becoming a growing, uh, a growing issue. And as Tobias pointed out, we're in a global battle, in inverted commas, with other global defence exporters. And if we can't even domestically provide services to those, that supply chain, we, we're in big trouble. So I wanted really, I don't quite know how you fix it, but I'd love to know some, get some ideas from the panel. On, Thank you on for on making the point about Thank the you. dead hand of ESG. Um, the gentleman in front there, yes, with the blue, thank you. And can we have a question, please, because the minister has to dive off very fast. So sure, fast Jack questions. Richardson, I'm a freelance journalist working in industrial participation. We talk a lot about um, our, both our own programmes and commercial off the shelf, but I'm just interested to know, as the integrated review refresh goes forward, where we are with the other area, which is, um, which is using offset and industrial participation to, to, to um, manufacture overseas equipment here. Mm. Anyone have a view on that? Integration. No takers. Well, well I, mean, I mean, there did a few things. Um, just let me try and deal with some of the points. First of all, thank you to Make UK Defence, which does really important work, and I was very pleased to come and speak at, at your uh, conference. Uh, you're right, we are just clinging on on that point. We've got to get real. There are other people who, particularly the French, who are stealing a march on us, frankly, out in, you know, they've supplied frigates to the Greeks, they're doing a lot in South America, they're applying, supplying Rafale to the Indians and so on. So we've really got to, uh, to get real about that point. The, point the, the thing you were making about the sin stock, it's a really difficult nut to crack this one, but we have to take this moment to say, to invest in uh, munitions, to invest in defence stocks, is to invest in the defence of freedom to a people to allow them to live their lives unthreatened, unmenaced by those who believe that might is always right and the international rules-based order is some kind of quaint relic from a bygone era. So we have to articulate that unashamedly and powerfully, and I'm certainly committed to doing so, but bluntly it will take, it will take others to play their part. So that is an ongoing conversation that we should, we should definitely have. On the issue of um, offsets, that's, a re that's quite a crunchy specific point that I know specifically that the French are trying to handle in the way that they uh, uh, try and, for example, get their jet engine technology into India by saying, well, hang on a second, we'll, we'll offset it by doing a whole load of other work here. It, it, you, I found when I was out there, actually, trying to advance the Rolls-Royce alternative, that the issue of offsets very soon gets into extremely difficult issues with foreign governments who say, hang on a second, are you basically backsliding on your offset agreement? So uh, that is actually an area where other countries have sought to do it unsuccessfully that we can distinguish ourselves and show that there is an alternative uh, a way of uh, achieving the contractual requirements. James, you wanted to... Yeah, on, on the latter question, I think we've seen recently um, very successfully where foreign platforms, the Cougar platform, for example, has been integrated in the UK. We've seen NPR, I suppose, do that, Morgan and other companies. And, of course, the Mastiff and the Ridgeback were fantastic platforms and are right now. Um, so I think that uh, it's entirely plausible that, uh, that we could do more of that. It works. Why? It's great for UK jobs. It's great for UK industry. We keep these capabilities in the UK, even though we may not be able to produce those chassis in the first place. So I think that integration is absolutely a model that we should be encouraging in the future. Tobias. Yes, I, on the point of SMEs, they are so crucial. Uh, yes, we talk about the big ones they've been you know, mentioned today, BA Systems, Babcock, Thales, and so forth. It's all these tiny little SMEs that actually yeah. help support and allow these bigger uh, industries, uh, capabilities, companies to be able to flourish. So I am concerned that there may be some hurdles that they're now having to bump into. And I will put this to my committee to see whether we can do a study in this, to not first understand the problems in depth, and then to perhaps look at one of the solutions, because the, if, if culturally we're going down this road, this is detrimental. It actually is helping the enemy, if you think about it. It's actually helping our adversaries, because we can't procure the necessary equipment that we need for the future. And just a very quick point on that. One of the things that I've asked to take place on this is don't just have a dashboard telling you the health of your primes, your Babcocks. I want to have a dashboard which tells me the health 
of my 200 most important SMEs so that, that if necessary, by the way, you know, I'm a conservative, I want these companies to succeed or fail on their own merits, but I want to know in advance whether they are uh, facing financial uh, vulnerability so that we can take whatever appropriate steps uh, we can. Uh, other countries do this better than us. We've got to have a much more strategic overview about the SME base in this country so that we can nurture it, uh, support it, and potentially you know, sometimes hold it to account. That is really, really important. That's something I'm very keen to emphasize. Can I go further? I think that where we've got industry in the UK struggling or not quite meeting enough orders, I think it's incumbent upon government to step in. And there are companies that we all know right now in the UK that need to be looked after a lot better. Um, because if we lose these capabilities, lose these companies, we won't get them back. I'm really sorry, everyone. We have absolutely run out of time. The minister has to leave. So thank you for your attention. And thank you to the panel for giving us such food for thought and sharing your insights. Um, as this is a Conservative Home conference, I will leave you with a quote from a Conservative Prime Minister. Um, Margaret Thatcher said, Peace freedom and justice are only to be found where people are prepared to defend them. Thank you very oh, much.